Hello healers, my name is Ben and this is The Moss Report. I'm here today with my father, author and founder of The Moss Report, Dr. Ralph W. Moss. Good morning, Dad. Good morning, Ben. I've been feeling rather sentimental in the build-up to making this recording as we are celebrating a few different anniversaries. The first is the anniversary of your birth that we've just celebrated 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. So congratulations and happy birthday again. Thank you. I'm sure our audience also wishes you a happy birthday. Thanks. And we're also marking 50 years from our relocation from California to New York. Um, and then the subsequent year, you started working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. And that was the beginning of your career as a science writer on the topic of cancer. And our involvement as your family members, peripherally, and in some cases directly, as that career developed. And I'm also recollecting, and I was thinking about my, I think, earliest experience participating in the production of the Moss Report, which occurred when I was in my teens. And I recall very clearly you telling me that you needed my help. And I was very enthusiastic about wanting to do that. And in particular, it was around something to do with this very topic that we're going to be discussing today. Yes. And I'll just briefly share that story with our audience, just as a little backstory. So I guess I was probably 15 or 16 years old, and you had said that you had coming over from Japan a couple of Japanese scientists who were doing interesting work researching the benefits and the properties of medicinal mushrooms, in particular, the species of mushrooms that are prevalent in Japanese culture, maitake and shiitake and, and others. And that these, and, and in order to be prepared to receive them, we needed to sort of scramble to set up some camera gear which we didn't own at that time. And I remember going to the store and, and making the purchases of the tripod and that Hi8 camera. And, um, and then we set it all up with microphones. And I mean, it was a big production for us. We, I think we rented a space or we had access to some office space somewhere. And, it was a hotel, I think. And I anyway, we set up the... Uh, the camera gear and recorded them talking to you. And then we had a translator, a gentleman named Mike Sirota, who the footage of you talking with Mike is the only thing that I could actually find of yeah. those recordings. Unfortunately, yeah. somehow the actual recordings of the Japanese scientists are, are lost and mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to put my hands on them, but I definitely recall very clearly you having those conversations and talking with Mike Sharota about this subject in English, although the other scientists did not speak English. Uh, Dr. Namba, I think, was the name, N-A-N-B-A. We're naturally skeptical mm -hmm. of claims that are made that, yes. you know, you can... Uh, somehow inhibit cancer growth and so forth. Um, are these studies, is this hearsay or are these published in regular um, scientific journals? All the animal studies has been published since 1986 in several Japanese uh, journals, mm -hmm. academic journals, as well as international journals. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a long time ago, over 40 years since that recording, and we're still talking about and producing content about medicinal mushrooms. Yeah. In your opinion, what is the most significant scientific study to date relating to medicinal mushrooms 
and integrative oncology or, or cancer treatments? I don't think there is a kind of blow away study the way there is with other things or where you could point to something like a really a, a benchmark type of study. But there are strong suggestions in uh, scattered out through a lot of papers, and some of them are in Japanese and some of them are in Chinese. The anchor for us is the fact that <clears throat> derivatives of mushrooms, particularly turkey tail, which we'll talk more about, are approved medications in China and in Japan for cancer. So they went through the whole approval process with the data presented, the papers published, peer-reviewed journal articles, and so forth. And it was strong enough to convince two governments, two very big, important governments, of course, that this warranted actual approval, government, like, quote, unquote, FDA approval. So I think that's our starting point. But the topic is it huge. It's, it's extremely diverse. The, pap the papers that have been produced are very in quality. Uh, it's easy to poke holes in some of the, the, some of the limitations of some of the studies that are done. So it's hard to come up with a definitive statement because you're talking about hundreds of different possible species of mushrooms and hundreds of chemicals that vary from mushroom to mushroom and then different methods of preparation. <clears throat> and there's a, when we get into the practicalities of this, of course, everybody's going to want to know what should I take and how much should I take of it and will it, you know, what's it going to do for me? And there are hundreds of different types of cancers as well. There are over, well over a hundred different types of cancer. So, you know, it's almost infinitely complicated and, and we don't want to mislead anybody. We don't want to raise excessive expectations. On the other hand, we don't want to be a downer and just, you know, just repeat the usual advice, which is ask your physician. Of course, you should ask your physician, but how many physicians in, in the US or Europe really know or understand these things? I've, I've, you know, a handful come to mind, but that's, that's about it. I just want to, as my basic starting point, I want to say that I think that mushrooms and, uh, and, and not only, I mean, particularly medicinal mushrooms in the Asian tradition are extremely promising, powerful food substances and, and, and actually quickly grade over into the realm of medicine, hence the term medicinal mushrooms. So even though we're going to talk about some details about a particular kind of mushroom and a particular kind of cancer, mushrooms as a category are greatly underappreciated in Western culture. That That's way. true. Uh, I wonder if it's partly because of their availability or is it perhaps because they're weird? And people have an aversion to things that look weird yeah. and maybe they're slimy or they're dried out. I mean, I yeah, I think in some ways mushrooms are kind of scary also because some of them can be poisonous. Correct. I think that's I think that's the main thing. It's like with snakes. Snakes, you know, I mean they're slithery and they're weird, but they also can bite, you know, kill you. <laughs> with one bite, some of them. Um, and the mushrooms can kill you with one bite, you biting them instead of the snakes biting you. But they, they're they dangerous. They have an aura of, of danger uh, around them, which makes them also fascinating. Then there is also the issue of the, psycho, the psychoactive component that mushrooms historically, um, if you ask any anthropologist, you know, they... they 
the magic mushrooms, the mushrooms, the psilocybin, and these are, you know, portals uh, into another realm of, of, um, of consciousness. So there, there, there's many areas that they're fascinating. I have friends who go out in the woods and pick mushrooms. I, I, I walk in the woods almost every day, but I don't pick mushrooms. And I have to get, I have to insert a little family anecdote here, if I may. When your son and my grandson Jacob was three years old and you were teaching up in upstate New York, I took him for a walk in the woods behind your house. And I, he was three and I was taking him by the hand and we were going, and I was telling him, oh, you see, that's a mushroom. Mushrooms are very, very important, Jacob. They're, they're very powerful. They can, you know, people make medicines out of, out of them and so forth. And then we continued on the walk. And as we got to the end of the walk, I noticed that he, his little fist was clenched. And I said, Jacob, what do you what do you have there? What's in your hand? He opened it up. <laughs> it was a mushroom. And I said, what are you doing with that? He said, well, you said that they were very good, <laughs> that this was good medicine or something. So I thought, uh-oh, you know, you got to be careful what you say. And I will repeat that, that admonition. You've got to be careful because we have to, we, if we say that something has been great potential as medicine, we're also saying that it could cause side effects. It could, it could have negative effects. It could, it could, it cuts both ways, right? We can't have, can't have it all be like everything is positive and you're just going to take this and some wonderful things going to happen. I want to focus on two things. One is the anti-cancer effect and the other is the immune effect. So both of those things are important. And there are supplements and foods that will do one or the other thing. But mushrooms will do both. So this makes them extremely, extremely desirable and important from the point of view of the self-help aspect of cancer. You're not likely to get a recommendation about this from your your doctor, even your oncologist, they're not, they're really usually not terribly well informed. And the, the literature, the, the summations that you see are kind of negative, as I said earlier, because the quality is variable in terms of the studies. I, I've picked out um, three, three papers uh, to talk about. And, and um, the first of these most of these actually are about um, Trimedes versicolor, also known as Coriolis versicolor, which is um, which is turkey tail. And anybody who walks in the woods has probably walked by this uh, fifty times. Um, it grows on dead or dying trees, and it has the brownish color. And if you can see on the screen. It's called versicolor, meaning alternating colors. So you see there's a light and a dark and a light and a dark and so forth. And, and that's, that's the first characteristic. And the second characteristic, it's a, what's called a polypore, which simply means that on the bottom, instead of having gills, it has little pores that um, uh, uh, also function uh, for, the, for the mushroom. So this is concentric zones of color. I do not suggest that you just pick these and, and eat them. And in this is a very, very good paper uh, by uh, uh, Solomon Hopter Marian. Mariam did a fantastic job of reviewing the entire topic of uh, turkey tail and cancer, and we'll post a, a link. The, f- the full uh, article is available free on the web, and that's wonderful, open access. I highlighted a few of the things that he says. Um, a Chinese traditional medicine use of turkey tail mushroom dates back at least 2,000 years and includes general health promoting effects, including endurance and longevity, 2,000 years. And it's been used as a tea, dried and ground up, and um, and then, of course, when you digest it, it there's some other uh, compounds that are formed in the body to make you know make it even more uh, complicated. 
38 phenols in the flavonoid family. We talked about flavonoids in one of our earlier uh, videos, Ben. Um, and the, the best known of these are uh, PSP, which comes from China, and, uh, and PSK, also known as Crestin, uh, polysaccharide K from Japan. Both products have been approved as medicines, primarily as adjuvants in cancer therapy. But there are over 100 strains just of, of uh, Trimedes versicolor, of the turkey tail, 100 strains. And these each of them could be quite different one from the other. And so, um, you know, that, that, that variety, which is wonderful to, to think about, and raises all kinds of possibilities of finding even more effective strains of this, but it also makes analysis more difficult because you might get an effect with one, one mushroom or one strain that you wouldn't get with another one. But during the 1990s, um, it was shown that uh, the polysaccharides, the main, the main medicinal ingredient in these, uh, in these mushrooms, inhibits... Uh, liver cancer in rats. And then since that time, the direct anti-cancer effect of turkey tail has been demonstrated in various experimental models in the test tube, in lab animals, and in clinical trials. This is the basic uh, point. It works almost across the board on cancer types. In other words, when they tried it in different cancer cell lines, that's the test tube type of experiment. It killed uh, cancer in incredibly large number of cancer types, I'm quoting them directly, including breast, lung, colon, leukemia, cervix, stomach, prostate, brain, liver, and ovarian. Amazing. Very few things. You can't make that statement about very many drugs out there. Some of the the experiments had anti-cancer activity at um, reasonable amounts that could be uh, achieved in the body. But interestingly, many experiments even showed activity at extremely low concentrations. So this is, this is very interesting and important because it may not be necessary to have, a, you know, to take a lot of this stuff. And uh, we'll talk some more about about that and about what the pro what the dose a reasonable dose would be. I also they don't go into it here, but there's also a, a strong possibility and some evidence that different mushrooms uh, have a synergistic effect with each other. They they are super additive to each other, so you may need even you know even small doses of each of a number of different mushrooms would be better than taking a lot of one particular mushroom. So I, I'm going to skip down here. You can, people can see as I go past it, the amazing amount of research that's been done on this topic. These are different preparations, different commercial sources, what the results are. And it's almost across the board, Ex extracts of turkey tail kill cancer cells. Okay, so they uh, suppress it and, and kill it. And there's one paper, Ben, that uh, shows that uh, turkey tail mushroom ki specifically kills cancer stem cells. And 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 I think I ha I think I'll be able to show that. But that's a very important and very. Um, a very up-to-date finding because, of course, more and more attention is being paid to the the cancer stem cells that keep the cancer alive even in the face of chemotherapy. So anything natural that'll kill cancer stem cells is of great interest. I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through the evidence for efficacy in animal models. It's the same story basically. It kills cancer when the cancer is implanted into mice. Um, and uh, let's go straight to the evidence of efficacy through clinical trials. Right. Um, there is a randomized control trial using 2.4 grams as a daily treatment for about six weeks that showed a, be a better quality of life. I don't think that 
this was enough time. It was enough of the substance, but it wasn't enough time. Six weeks in advanced patients with liver cancer, I wouldn't expect it to have much of an effect on the, you know, the cancer itself. But it did improve the quality of life, which is extremely important. On the other hand, a pilot study um, uh, of randomized double-blind multi-dose study on dogs, not humans, revealed that treatment with a turkey tail extract, <clears throat> 100 milligrams per kilogram capsules, could delay the progression of metastases in a particular kind of cancer fairly common among dogs. Uh, a systematic review and meta-analysis assessed the survival outcome in cancer patients from 13 clinical trials. Just to, to refresh people's memory, a meta-analysis or a systematic review is when you take other people's papers and you sort of uh, assess their value and you combine the results. And they reported an impressive result showing a significant survival advantage when compared to standard conventional anti-cancer agents alone. For example, a 9% absolute reduction in five-year death rate uh, with one additional patient alive for every 11 patients treated. They also reported a better five-year survival rate in patients receiving combination treatment in cases of breast stomach, and colorectal cancer. And I want to now pivot to another paper, a study in stomach cancer from Osaka City University. And here's what they showed. 349 patients with stages 2 and 3 stomach cancer. The three-year recurrence-free survival rates uh, was 47% in the chemotherapy-only group and was 65% in the turkey tail added group. So in other words, it added uh, about almost 20% uh, chance of being cancer-free, cancer recurrence-free, just by taking a supplement of turkey tail mushrooms. Mm -hmm. and, um, there was prolonged survival, but there is a a class of patients who have a particularly less favorable characteristic to their cancer, that's called MHC negative. Uh, there were 82 uh, such cases, and the difference was that in those more advanced or more dangerous kinds of cancer, 28% uh, recurrence-free survival after, after surgery, recurrence-free survival, 28% in the chemo-only group, and 68% then uh, re recurrence-free survival in the turkey tail group. And so this a, is the more dangerous correct. particular type of gastric cancer? Correct. Hmm. Correct. Wow. And there was a... <clears throat> A 40% difference, 40% advantage from 28% wow. to 68%. I, it's, it's really kind of crazy, isn't it? I mean, crazy good <laughs> in the sense. It's crazy that, that we don't have that information at our fingertips Yes, for anybody who's dealing with gastric cancer in particular, because there was a study to show this kind of data. Right. And what's the harm in taking something like this? It wouldn't be right. No right. potential downside, really. Doesn't seem. Well, maybe, maybe if you took too much, you might get a stomach ache or diarrhea. And it's remarkable that the people who had the more dangerous type of gastric cancer had a stronger result uh, as far as the effect of the turkey tail on avoiding a recurrence. Uh, right. That seems like that information should be well known by anybody who's treating that malady. Yeah, but it's sure. not. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully we can help spread this info around. I mean, right. it's not 100% conclusive. No scientific study that we look at of this type is, but I I don't see that there would be any reason not to add turkey tail into a supplement 
regimen if you're dealing with this diagnosis or even a preventative measure to avoid getting one. I agree. I, I, and, and here's a very important sentence in the introduction. Uh, turkey tail, PSK in this case, is considered to demonstrate not only direct anti-cancer, cancer-killing activity, cytocytal means cancer-killing, cell-killing activity, but also anti-tumor immune enhancement effects. So it's, it's working on both of those key elements. I'll, I'll give you my, so these are, these are cancer cells that are lacking in the usual markers that would be recognized by the immune system, which suggests to me that this, this would point to the, can, the killing activity, the cancer cell killing activity. These cancers, by being more malignant, have more cancer stem cells. So I think this is a, a strong hint that what's going on here is that the, that the anti-cancer element within the turkey tail is going after the cancer stem cells. That prevents recurrence of the cancer. That at least would be my 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 working theory. Uh, if if I were you know uh, helping to advise somebody who was thinking of doing a uh, an experiment on this, and and um, we have a um, a very strong indication that this is what's going on in a paper from 2018 that originated. Uh, in Puerto Rico, and also at the NYU, uh, New York University School of Medicine in New York. And I won't go into any of the details on this. Anybody who's, you know, scientifically knowledgeable will understand this, that it down-regulates the STAT-3 pathway. The STAT-3 pathway is one of the key markers of cancer stem cells. So this is telling us that the anti-cancer activity of this mushroom, it happened to be a reishi mushroom, uh, targets breast cancer stem cells. They're not as well documented in terms of killing cancer stem cells as uh, some of the other uh, nutritional factors that we, we talk about, but they are definitely um, very important uh, in, as a potential agent for that. Whatever the, whatever the mechanism is, it, the evidence definitely strongly points towards them being beneficial on both fronts, immune enhancement and anti-cancer activity. So the world of mushroom supplements is divided into two camps. And the one camp basically are the people who believe that the activity most of the activity of the mushroom is in the fruit, fruiting bodies. So what do we mean by fruiting bodies? That's the, what the world calls mushrooms. Basically. The part that is above ground. See, it's above ground. That's what people pick. It's what goes into mushroom soup. You know, um, those are mush that's mushroom, the standard definition of mushrooms. But scientists know that, and you rarely ever see that there is a substructure to the uh, to the mushrooms. So there's sort of a basement floor that you never get to see, and there's a network of what are called mycelia uh, that are inhabiting the forest and maybe you know have other functions like connecting all the all the fruiting bodies that you see are just outcropping of a larger organism called the my the my based on the mycelium. And these mycelia might also connect trees one to another. It's sort of a nervous system in a way for the forest. So they're, they're fascinating. I know there was a movie made, a, f a documentary movie made recently about this. It was quite fascinating about the mycelia. So I'm not ruling out the possibility that the mycelia also have anti-cancer activity, but overwhelmingly the scientific data, the scientific evidence that we rely on for making uh, accurate statements about mushrooms are about the fruiting bodies and particularly hot water extracts of the fruiting bodies and only secondarily alcohol 
extracts of the fruiting bodies. So I'm looking, when I shop for mushroom uh, products, I'm looking for hot water extracts of fruiting bodies, maybe supplemented in some cases, like some of the harder mushrooms like reishi and turkey tail, uh, supplemented with an, <clears throat> an, an alcohol bath to extract <clears throat> some of the other substances that are present in the mushrooms that don't come out in the water, that are not water soluble. It's two sets of, of compounds. But at the very least, they all should be subjected to a hot water extraction process. So that's the first thing. A lot of products are based on mycelia. I was told that the mycelial uh, products are, I forget what they said, but it was about one-tenth the cost of extracting the fruiting bodies. The fruiting bodies, you have to buy mushrooms and treat them. The mycelia, they grow, they grow the mushrooms on, um, on rice cakes, typically. And then they cut off the mushrooms, sell them uh, for a higher price. And what's left are the blocks that they grew on. And then those are extracted. And yes, you will find glucans in there, but they're mostly alpha glucans, which is sort of the molecular signature of grain, rice mm -hmm. or wheat or whatever, oats, whatever it was, it was grown on. So um, I'm a suspicious mm -hmm. of products that uh, are uh, basically are mycelial products. And I, I just, uh, bottom line is I don't use them myself and I don't recommend them. I very strongly recommend using products that are fruiting bodies. It should state clearly on the label what they are. And there have been cases where <clears throat> um, people sold mushroom products and they were actually mycelial products. And I think that even though technically speaking, the mycelia is part of the mushroom, but it's not what people think of when they think they're getting mushrooms. So it's important from my point of view to go for the products that are based on real mushrooms, real, what we would call, what 99% of humanity would call mushrooms, the part that pops up after the rain in the forest or in a, you know, in a, in a green, in a greenhouse. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, as I say, what's the method of extraction? Because if they're using a bunch of chemicals to extract the so-called desirable elements, then you're getting other, other things added that you don't want. And I'm, su I'm suspicious of that also. So I'd look for hot water extract or water extract of fruiting bodies. That's the organic. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the, the bottom line. Now, the next part is which one, because there are hundreds of different possible, you know, certainly dozens, and you can name, there are some that are sort of also have positive uh, in, information about them, but you might only have two or three papers instead of two or 300 papers on them. So you're your knowledge base about them, your sense of um, of reliance or, or or trust in their in, in making them worthwhile taking isn't as great as it is if you've got a solid body of evidence to support it. If you were to take one mushroom, for instance, turkey tail, there is evidence from a clinical trial that was done uh, under the direction of a very good friend of mine, uh, Liana Standish, who is the head of research at Bastyr University in, in, in Seattle, that showed that it really would take about six grams per day uh, of mycelia. Now, unfortunately, they used a mycelial product, but it would take, so six grams to, to have a, a positive effect immune, on the immune system. Okay. So, that would be 12 capsules, 12, because the capsule is typically 500 milligrams. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to take. But again, I, I would never have done that experiment with mycelia. I don't know why they did that. Um, I'm sure the fruiting bodies would be more potent, uh, much more potent than that. So I don't think you ever you need to take that much. Um, 
But that's one experiment that was a little bit, uh, you know, threw us off a little bit. If you enter in the fact that, you know, now they can be made much, mo much more effectively, like I say, hot water extract of the, fr of the fruiting bodies and synergize, use, use a bunch, have a bunch of different ones connected. And there is a product out there. I don't know if we want to give trade names or, or not. We'll put links to the, in the description yeah. to the but, product you know, that you recommend. Right. So yeah. the combination of, of turkey tail, which we've talked about, shiitake, maitake, uh, chaga, uh, which is a, not exactly a mushroom. It's a, it's a fungal growth on, on a wounded tree. Um, uh, you, uh, which you, which grows in uh, the latitude, the higher latitude, 44 and above in terms of the geographically where you harvest it. And, um, uh, maybe cordyceps. I'm, I'm blocking on, uh, there's one more, uh, that I'm not, uh, bringing to mind ex immediately, but in any case, five, maybe six different ones taken together. Like you said turkey tail, maitake, shiitake, chaga, and reishi was the other one? Reishi, thank you, yes. Re exactly, and reishi. And those can be put together, and there is a product, Five Defenders, from a company called Real Mushrooms that, uh, mm -hmm. that I take. I just was handed a bottle. How do you like that? Yes. And, I, take and, this. I yeah. take one of these every day. Yes, and I I, I, I I do too, and uh, and we didn't discuss this in advance, you know. Nor nor are we. No, no but you were the one who yeah, sort of introduced I, me I, to I talked about product. it for a long time because it checks all the boxes for me. You know, it, interestingly, even even the white button mushroom, which which in various forms dominates the American market overwhelmingly, uh, and they I'd include in there the brown mushrooms, the portobello, these are all versions of, of the white button mushroom. Um, they have some activity to them as well, but I, but it's, it's small compared to the, the more flavorful, complicated, uh, uh, Asian mushrooms, but you can buy, uh, generally speaking, you won't have trouble. You don't have to, you don't have to go to an Asian market. I think, um, I have, you know, Asian markets differ. Asian markets differ uh, in terms of their accessibility to uh, non-Asian people, but most of them are very friendly and happy to, you know, instruct you. You and I had a funny experience when when we went to the the Boston Red Sox game some years ago, and we went after that we went to Chinatown, and we were walking in. We walked into a store, and do you remember we saw barrels of reishi mushroom, beautiful reishi mushrooms, you know, and, uh, but you, but reishi is hard as a rock. So how you would even process that, I don't know, you know, but you probably but, could pulverize it in a blender or a grinder of some kind. And yeah. I mean, I when know. I say hard as a rock, you might break your, your blender well, trying to do it. But in any case, mortar, mortar and pestle might work. The supplements that are using the mycelium not only are they using the non-fruiting body part of the mushroom, yeah. but they're also including a fairly generous portion of the substrate, e.g. the soil or the rice cake. You're not even getting anything out of it if it's a big chunk of some rice cake. The glucans are not beta-glucans, they're alpha-glucans. And alpha-glucans is the signature of, uh, of grain. So a lot of what they're getting is a grain extract and they're paying as if it was some sort of highly, you know, desirable mushroom. I think mycelia, there are some studies that show some activity to mycelial products as well. And it'd be, it would be strange if, they were, if the root system of the mushroom didn't contain some, you know, some of the beta glucans or some of the desirable components, but <clears throat> you're certainly going to be uh, not going to be getting the benefit you that you've read about uh, if you if you rely on those products. I'd be very cautious. Not only not only do you have to be cautious about getting mycelia, but you have to watch out for 
terms like whole plant extract or mixtures of, of mycelia and fruiting bodies because it could be 95% mycelia and 5% fruiting body. And this goes on. I mean, like any, like, you know, the natural food and natural supplement industry has a lot of problems. It, it's not to say it's as bad as like sometimes you get the impression that it's all a bunch of, you know, fraud and so forth. And there are people who take that position, but <clears throat> mostly the, the products are as advertised, but in the mushroom field, there is this tremendous temptation to go to the mycelia because as I say, it's like at least 10 times cheaper than the fruiting bodies. So there are good companies out there, but um, I rely a lot on consumerlab.com. And when I have a question about a supplement, that's one of the places that I go to. And they had a, a big review article they did on reishi mushrooms. And um, it was it was uh, the real mushrooms uh, uh, extract of reishi came out the clear winner. Mm -hmm. clear. And I'm reading from their website. It says here at Real Mushrooms, we use 100% pure mushroom fruiting bodies in all of our extracts and no added binders, fillers, starch, grain, or, and or mycelium. So I, I, and there are probably other companies that do that as well. Yeah. Um, I would say if anybody's looking into mushrooms, that that would be something that they'd want to find on the yeah. company website to see a statement that relates to yeah. the, the mycelium versus the fruiting body. And, and just as an observation, mm -hmm. the fruiting body has a greater variety of color and texture and mm -hmm. just seems like it would contain a greater variety of chemical compounds than something mm -hmm. that's more uh, uniform in its composition seeming. And I mean, it's just a visual observation. Absolutely. And now that you mentioned that I turned 80, uh, I've started to take reishi mushroom because it's called the, the mushroom of longevity. That's the rep that's its apparently a translation of its Chinese name. Um, so uh, you know, in terms of aging, you don't you you the na the natural tendency is for your immune system to to weaken over time. So uh, in order to prevent that, you maybe need a an additional help in terms of boosting the numbers and the activity of the of the white blood cells. So. Um, I intend to, to continue taking both the five defenders and the reishi. If you're taking a natural self-help approach to, uh, to your cancer, and not saying in any way to neglect the medical uh, aspect of cancer, which of course is extremely important, but in terms of what you can do as an individual, um, I, I would classify the medicinal mushrooms as indispensable. I don't think you've really created a, a comprehensive self-help plan for cancer unless some mushrooms are included in, some, in one way or another. I think, I think we should include my, my mushroom soup recipe uh, because you can get some of these things in edible form. They're very, it's very tasty. You can add what any other beneficial vegetables that you want or vegetables, you know, or elements for taste. There's nothing to, that I'm aware of that would contradict the, um, the effect of the, the mushrooms. And you can certainly get shiitake. You can get um, oyster mushrooms, depending on the store. Uh, you can get um, maitake in many places. And um, Whatever is there of a kind of, you know, Asian type of mushroom uh, that you can get your hands on. Uh, it won't do you much good to, th I don't think, to throw, you know, to, to throw reishi mushrooms in or turkey tail. They're hard. They're not going to dissolve. Into your not soup, hard. you mean? Yeah. They're not, they're too fibrous and too hard to, to eat. Mm -hmm. Um and they you and you probably would have to boil them for a very long time to get any benefit out of them but certainly the um the shiitake maitake and oyster and then throw in and I'll give the recipe that I the formula I came up with 
recipe formula or whatever. Um, uh, cabbage would be a, a, another very good additive. And of course, you know, all the vegetables that you, other than, you know, the starchy ones would be very good. So I, I guess that leads me to a question that we sometimes get that relates to cooking. So mm -hmm. the molecules that are these beta glucans and others that are being studied that show this potential for having an anti-cancer, anti-cancer stem cell effect, yeah. Do those break down, to your knowledge, uh, when you cook them? No, they're not destroyed because that's how they are extracted. I see. Hot, hot water extraction. So if anything, they're going to liberate. Now, if you if you overcook, uh, it probably you know probably would start to destroy them. But it isn't like some of the things that are you know like broccoli, where you destroy the enzymes that you don't get the sulforaphane. In the broccoli, you only get 10% uh, if you eat cooked broccoli uh, of the benefit. So Right. That was a whole have, topic that we've already discussed around right. how that molecule changes when you eat it. But you're saying that's not the case in mushrooms. It pretty much is the same molecule, fresh or cooked, yeah. regardless. And, and I think you have, to, you have to boil them pretty, you know, pretty vigorously to extract because mushrooms mushrooms have very thick cell walls that's to enable them to stand up in the forest so they have the stems and the mushrooms have a very thick cell wall are and you saying that it's advisable to cook <laughs> mushrooms oh absolutely okay the desirable element like the beta glucans and the polyphenols they are encased in the cell behind the thick cell cell wall. So you have to break that down. Now that could be broken down chemically, but I don't advise it. It's mostly through heat, through boiling, that they that they liberate the polyphenols. I wouldn't go on too long, but I think if you cook cook it, you know, for half an hour it would be mm -hmm. enough. Most doctors um, who might have reservations about their patients taking supplements have no problem with the patients adjusting their food intake however, almost however they like. There could be exceptions. In the case of the mushrooms, interestingly, one of the th caveats that you see commonly uh, raised by medical sources and medical websites is that you shouldn't take this if you're on immunosuppressive drugs, which is an interesting backhanded compliment to the mushrooms because what they're saying is that we put you on these powerful immune suppressors, like if you have a transplant, but taking the mushrooms could overwhelm and overcome the these powerful anti-immune immune drugs. Because it's so, an immune stimulant? Correct. It's an acknowledgement, a backhanded compliment, as I said, that that these things are so such powerful immune stimulants that they might overcome. So there are circumstances in which people shouldn't take the mushrooms, but they're relatively uncommon and no harm in running this past your oncologist and or or past your your general um, primary care doctor. Um, but as I said, and this goes for other supplements as well. That if you say I'm going to take a supplement of something, then you know suddenly they're they're nervous. But if you say I do you have any problem with me eating mushroom soup? <laughs> They'd feel awfully silly to, to most of them to say not to do that. But I'm but I'm counting on a synergy because there there are some that are different in each one of them. And that completes the spectrum, as it were, or it, it broadens the spectrum of the positive um, elements. And I think they reinforce each other. There is a little bit of evidence for that synergy, but that's, that's a whole area that could be explored. Yeah. So, um, but at the moment, there's no, no, no re good reason that I can see why you shouldn't try to increase that synergy and broaden the amount, the anti-cancer effects and the immune modulating effects. And then the other p point that I, I would want to make is that it's, it doesn't cost much to have a, a CBC, a complete blood count, 
and a metabolic panel done. Uh, Life Extension Foundation, um, they offer through LabCorp and Walgreens. I mean, it's you can go get for $25 at the moment. Uh, you can get a complete blood test done, even if you're on, if you, or you could just go to your doctor and ask them to do that. So one thing you could do is, even though it's, you, it's hard to monitor usually the, what's happening in terms of cancer in your body, but you can measure what's happening to your immune system very accurately. Mm -hmm. So you try doing, take a blood test, make sure you take a blood test in advance of starting the mushrooms, then take the mushrooms for a month or two, and then do another blood test after that and see and what the data happens. point on that is the white blood cell count. Yes. And also specifically the lymphocyte count. Lymphocytes. Mm -hmm. Because within the category of lymphocytes are the, the main cells that kill cancer cells. Mm -hmm. So you want to have uh, a, a robust immune system, which from other studies, I would say would be 1.8 uh, K. And that brings us back to the point that you made earlier, which was that this particular substance, these, these medicinal mushrooms have that dual effect, yes. both as an immune booster and fighting cancer through the action of fighting cancer stem cells yes. and maybe other ways. Right. Well, thanks for that. It's been a, a lot of fun revisiting this topic with you after 40 years and, uh, and coming back full circle on this topic of, of medicinal mushrooms. There's certainly a lot more discovery that anyone who's interested in this topic can, can find out for themselves, um, some of which is available on themossreport.com. We have a number of articles that you've written in the past on that topic, as well as the recipe, which we'll link to. But for now, for The Moss Report, I'm Ben Moss. How are you healing today? Thank you for watching. We really appreciate all of the support. Please leave a like, a comment, subscribe to the channel, and visit themossreport.com. We wish you all the best for health and healing.